One more round of applause for Isaiah Cartwright, please. I don't think so. I'm surprisingly loud, so. All right, hey everyone, uh, I'm Isaiah Cartwright. I've been working on ArenaNet for like 14 years now. Uh, I started off doing uh, game balance for them and now I kind of run the design department over there. Um, and so uh, every kind of month I do a big talk for uh, internally, we kind of do a little kind of designer training thing that goes on. And uh, this was a talk I made for that about game balance because it's something I'm always ranting and going on about. Uh, and I figured it might be useful for everyone here. All right, so first thing I always like to talk about game balance is that it's really kind of this weird mixture of art versus science. Everyone kind of has this like initial impression of uh, game balance that you could write some formula and just solve it. Uh, and so far I've never found that to be the try. I've, I've tried to solve it with an equation. Uh, maybe some neural network uh, computers at some point could do this for us, but until then, I think there is this middle ground where you use a lot of math and science to, to solve your problems, but you also use a lot of gut and kind of uh, you know, knowledge that you build up over time. Um, one of the big things that balance ends up being is that uh, the perception of balance matters a whole lot more than the reality of balance. Uh, and, I, and, you know, rock, paper, scissors is a game that everyone thinks of like, oh, this is a perfectly balanced game. Uh, but, like, the extremist in me knows that rock has frame advantage over all of the others. So there's clearly some imbalances there. Um, but, like, at the end of the day, you end up balancing perception way more than anything else. You know? And it's like you even take... Uh, a game like chess, where everyone's like, this game is really, really balanced. I know that one of these sides is actually better than the other. Uh, the computers will probably figure it out here real soon if they haven't already, uh, because one goes first. And like, I don't know, maybe it's first good or bad. Uh, it doesn't matter, because as long as everyone thinks it's balanced, then it is balanced. Uh, you know, this comes into like StarCraft, uh, which is a game that uh, I've spent a lot of time studying and, and worked on balance-wise. And like everyone thinks of this game as really, really balanced. But there's been times when the game is people have think this thing is, uh, you know, Zerg is the most powerful or Terran's the most powerful. And there are always kind of these debates that go on between that stuff. And it's the perception that the game kind of rotates and is balanced that matters. And so a lot of what I talk about uh, is going to be talking about how you deal with the balance of perception. Uh, one big thing I always like to kind of point out someone, and this is a big mistake that a lot of people make when it comes to balance. I always uh, say that balance is like changing the volume on a television. You're sitting on your couch, you got a bunch of people over, and everyone's like, wow, it's too loud. Uh, someone needs to change the, you know, balance the, the volume. Uh, and so usually one person picks up the remote and lowers the volume a little bit. You don't know how much. It's not like you pick up and go, we're going to go down three notches. All right? You just kind of start doing it. And then uh, sometimes you go a little too low, and you got to go up, and you check with everyone. You're like, is this right? All right, we're good. That's kind of how balance works. And so the big mistake that I see a lot of people do is they try to get more than one person holding that remote. If everyone in the room was to pick up the remote at the same time and start moving that thing up and down, nothing would work. It wouldn't, like, you wouldn't get to that right level of where you're going. And so you do want to have like, a group of people that you're talking your, your, your things through and that you're saying, oh, the volume's too loud, but, and you're going to check with them. But at the end of the day, assign one person to do the, the, the final call. One person goes, I'm going to make the call one way or the other, and they solicit feedback from everyone else. And so there's kind of this sense of like singular control is how I always do it. Even though we have a company of 400 and way too many things to balance, uh, there's still one person that makes all the calls on the balance, and that changes over time. Uh, this is a funny little rule that I picked up doing balance along the way. Um, it turns out I hate this number uh, in balance, and it's a really bizarre uh, thing. Uh, but what happens when you have one, is uh, you, you get in and you start playing with it and you realize you need to make it better. And so you can only go to double. Your, your like, granularity of change is really terrible. You can't ever really reduce it. You can only increase it. Now, uh, the one should not be confused with this number, which is amazing, uh, a totally good number that you can uh, change and manipulate all at once. But uh, as a rule, I kind of try to avoid using one in any of my balance as an initial uh, kind of thing that I dump in. Uh, just because it leads to a lot of problems. On Guild Wars 2, we started off and we had the newbie zone in the game, and uh, we had one as the starting experience value of, of the knowledge. And uh, 
we're playing and, and going and play testing. We're like, all right, we need to tweak it a little bit. And I had to rework the entire experience curve of all the levels in the game and rework everything because I started with one. Avoid it, it's a terrible number. Uh, there is some good sides to it. It's kind of clear. We actually all understand what one is. Uh, and so later on in the process, when your balance is a little more locked down, you can use one to make things more clear, but it just realize it's something that you can't balance around once you, once you get it going. Um, a lot of the balance methodology that I use is uh, really what I call kind of balancing for the margin of error. Uh, the idea is if you, are tr if you have something and you can kind of feel like, uh, feel out the balance of margin of error when you're playing with something, if you're trying to like decide whether something's balanced and you start tweaking it and like you tweak it a little bit and oh, it's overpowered. And you tweak it a little bit and oh, it's underpowered. That means you have a really narrow window of a margin of error. It means you have to like get something to feel balanced, it's got to land in this tiny little window. Uh, and in general, it's a lot of work to get things to go in there. And since my, my goal in life is to be as lazy as possible, uh, then uh, I try to get really big margins of error. And this is why StarCraft works so well. Uh, you know, a lot of the methodologies that went into that game as being a balance was they didn't try to balance everything on this hairline. They was like, they would take uh, types of mechanics and say this thing counters all of these things and so it allowed them to have this large margin of error uh, and so whenever you're looking at trying to balance something think about that think about when you're tweaking and you're changing the numbers when you start to find that like finickiness where you there's like this tiny little window you probably need to change your system you probably need to tweak your your, your things so that it's not so finicky because you'll always fail when the margins really small all right, um, this talk's gonna kind of go through a bunch of different types of balance because the term balance can mean a whole lot of different things. Uh, the first one that I'm gonna talk about is called kind of component balance. This would be very similar to like balancing a bunch of magic cards or balancing a bunch of items or balancing a bunch of skill powers in a game. Uh, it's probably where most of us think of balance lives, but balance also lives on an economy level. You end up balancing how an economy functions or you end up balancing uh, like pacing of stories and content and things like that. And I think those all uh, end up being a lot more of the talk's gonna be on component balance because that's where all the funny craziness is at. All right, uh, so comparison balance uh, or component balance is what I like to go on about. It's uh, usually trying to get to this concept of different but equal. Um, it's trying to go, I want all these things to be really, really different from each other, but also like all kind of be the same power level. Uh, and this concept ends up being very difficult, which is why uh, most of the kind of craziness about balance lives in this zone. Uh, but there's some techniques to help. So uh, kind of the first one that I always go is when you're trying to make things different, it's funny, you actually want to make them way more different from each other than similar. You know, I always like to go to this old D&D example that I think is, um, is, is pretty telling of this problem. Human beings are really good at being able to go, oh, that one's better. Uh, and like, you know, when I was a kid in D&D and I used to see there was all these different weapons, it used to drive me nuts because it was just like, well, that one's the best one, right? And like suddenly your brain just immediately discounts all the rest of them. And you know, D&D over the years has been trying to solve this with like making this one do more crit damage or I'll give little bonuses to things. But it's really hard when it's easy for us to just kind of like look at them and go, well, one, one of those is better. Um, and so easy comparisons is kind of a danger and it makes that margin of balance really low. It also makes the perception of balance worse. But hard comparisons, uh, these are things that are like, very difficult for you just to instantly go, oh, that one's better. Uh, you know, and I always uh, take the three starting units in StarCraft. If you're not familiar with these, uh, you have a unit that's a ranged unit that kind of has medium health. You have a, a, a melee unit with really low health, and then a melee unit with high health and a shield. Somehow all of these things are balanced with each other despite being very, very different and very, very, uh, you know, kind of interesting. And that is because it's really hard for our brain to go, that one's better. It's really, you know, there's so many differences between them that it, that it makes it more difficult. Uh, you know, another good example of this is like in uh, TF2. Uh, in this game, you have these kind of classes that you select and all of them have really crazy differences between weapons that they use, health that they use. And so it's really hard for you to be like, well, a heavy is better than the medic. Like that doesn't happen. You, it's all situational. It's all uh, comparative. And so when you're trying to put things together, make things more um, different from each other can actually make it easier to balance than hard. Uh, and it's kind of unintuitive, but it, but it helps a lot. Uh, a good example I like to use about this is I'm like, uh, in a zombie apocalypse, do you want a door or do you want a marker? Uh, 
they're really different from each other. Uh, and you can make arguments for the other ones. If you're trying to like hold some zombies out of a room, a door is real good. Uh, but if you need to plan an escape, markers are actually quite useful. Uh, and so like this kind of, the more different your parts are, the easier it is for you to kind of create situations where sometimes they're useful and sometimes they're not. Uh, all right. Uh, the main tool I use for everything is Excel, uh, and so if you're doing any sort of game balance and you're trying to uh, do this stuff, use this tool. It's just the best, period. Anyone else that says anything, they're wrong. Uh, that could be my opinion, but uh, it's the right one. Um, and so uh, a technique that I use a lot in uh, balance, especially when you're looking at uh, parts, is what I call a grading chart. Uh, this is used very, very heavily in fighting games, but I find you can apply it to anything. I've done this on Magic, I've done this on board games, I've done this on all, everything that I could imagine. Uh, and it's a really simple concept. Uh, what it is, is you kind of stack rank all of the skills in the game, and you, or all the components, all the items, anything that you have, and you kind of throw them into these buckets. Uh, S tier, or God tier, that's often referred to, these are things that are basically super overpowered. Everyone uses them. They're the, like, the thing that everyone's trying to beat. A tier are stuff that is like the highest level. People are using them all the time, but they have some weaknesses. They're not completely overpowered. Uh, B tier are things that could be A tier under certain situations, like they're really good at countering something, uh, and so they become really good. You use them, but only when the meta is in a weird place. Uh, C tier, or in this particular example, there's a lot. I usually don't go any farther than C. Is just always bad, or um, you know, they, their power level is just so much weaker than everything else. You tend to never use them. Uh, I find that I'm like the ideal world that you're trying to live in is that you have no C's or S's and everything are A's and B's. Uh, if you ever make one of those games, I'd love to know because I have not been able to succeed at it, uh, nor does it seem to be anyone else. Uh, usually what happens if you feel like you've succeeded at it, you just look at your A's and B's and then recategorize everything and they fall back into the same charts. Uh, but sometimes periodically making this chart of all of your components uh, can really, really be useful. Uh, I often find the technique I use is I'll take like four or five people on a team and I'll be like, take all the things and just grade them, you know, S to C. And you do it, we all do it together, and then we put them all into Excel and you kind of match it up and you'll see that like 90% of them you'll all just have agreed. And then it's easy, you can just go take all the C's and you buff them. And you go take all the S's and you can nerf them. And that's how you can kind of bring things in equilibrium. And it helps you just give some targeting to say this is what we need to focus on uh, to help kind of bring a little balance to, to the world. Um, and this is an example uh, of, a, of me doing that. I took some different people on the team, asked them. Uh, in this case, they put question marks when they didn't know. Uh, the, also, there's a funny thing this kind of technique can do. is Most of the time, people don't play their own game all that much, or not nearly as much as they should. Uh, and so when they have to go grade something, then they often find they don't have an opinion on something. And it can be a thing that screams at you, ah, I better go play with that thing. I better go interact with that component a lot more. And then it can help you kind of be in the habit of playing with all of your pieces and getting that kind of like perception of what your balance should be. So really good uses for this, this technique. Uh, you know, it forces familiarity, like I was saying. Uh, it pushes, uh, you find like, it finds the outliers. It doesn't find the middle ground. If everything is kind of close together, it's not a very good technique. Uh, but it can really find your things that are really broken or really crappy. Uh, and it's great for when you need to buff things. So if you're trying to like get more components usable in your system or more interactions, it's a really good technique. All right, um, mechanical charts. Uh, this is a, a type of chart that I use a lot of the times that helps you take your components in a system and really break them down into what they're doing. Uh, a lot of these examples I'm using very power-based uh, kind of systems, but you can apply this to anything. You can apply it to an item system or anything where you're trying to compare lots of different parts together. And so what you do is you take the component and you just make some really keywords about what it is. For example, a fireball is a projectile AOE. So is a grenade, right? Uh, and so these things on a component level are exactly the same, even though on an aesthetics level they're very different. Uh, this becomes really important because when you're starting to balance something and you find out that all your fireballs are wrong in your game, probably might mean you have problems on your grenades too, and you just didn't really think about there being a correlation. And so I make these kind of mechanical charts. Uh, they're really, really good for, um, for QA. Uh, when QA is trying to test through things, it, it, the only thing they really care about most of the time is the, is the mechanics of something. And so being able to take a list of like a thousand components and realize that there's only maybe like 30 to 40 uh, actual kind of differences between them, or here's the mechanical level, can really reduce how much someone has to QA through a product. Uh, and it also can help you kind of realize that too many of your parts are the same. 
you know, if your if your game ends up having a whole lot of grenades and fireballs, and when you when you like everything in the game is projectiles and AOE, it means your components are all more similar. See all my previous examples of why you shouldn't do that, uh, and you can go, okay, well maybe the grenade needs to knock back, or the fireball does some burning, or you know, you can start to add some differences to make your parts uh, have kind of different meanings. Um, did I hit everything? Uh, yeah, it pushes on diversity. Uh, relationship charts. This is a, a type of chart where you take all your components and you actually try to see how they interact with each other. This can be quite difficult when you have lots of components, uh, but uh, you, when you take your mechanical chart, you can kind of break them up into different categories and can kind of help you. In this particular chart that I had, I had a whole bunch of units with health and a whole bunch of damages, and I was trying to look at the different relationships between these damage categories and the health categories. Because I found if something has 35 damage and I make it 45, my brain goes, oh, I made it better. But for uh, you know, something with 50 and 100 health, there was zero change. And so you need to kind of be able to understand the relationships to your pieces. And so making some of these charts can kind of really highlight what it actually means. Because when it comes to damage and health, they're very relative. You can add zeros to all of that stuff. It doesn't matter. Uh, and, and, but it's the only thing that really matters is how many attacks it takes to kill something. Right? Like that is what damage and health, the kind of relationship. And so when you break down your components into this kind of relationship between parts, you'll see a bunch of more uh, you know, kind of like triggering moments of things of why something's overpowered or not. Um, this thing's really good for finding those edges. You know, there is some techniques in balance that you use, which is kind of called edge balance, where if you have um, something with like 50 health and something that does 45 damage, then it still takes two hits to kill that thing. But when they get one level, you know, they upgrade it or they get one more power, it's one hit. And so you create this kind of like times two power level, even though when you look at this, the ability, it only increased by 10%. And so it's this kind of weird concept of edge balancing. Uh, and it, all you're really doing is exploiting the concept of breakpoints. You're exploiting these like moments where the damage and the, the relationship between the damage and health uh, change really rapidly. And so these kind of charts are really good for finding those things, whether you want to do them or avoid them. Often uh, they can be negative parts of game balance where you're under, all of a sudden the game got really easy and you don't know why. And it's because this like 5% change changed these relationships really hard. Uh, they're also really, really good for cost versus effect analysis. If you're kind of playing with like a magic light system or a power system, magic has a really clear cost, like the amount of mana it costs to cast something, and then effect, which is what the card does. And so there's all this kind of like balance rules that they develop over time to say like this much mana equals this much power. Uh, and when you're looking at kind of these uh, relationship charts, you can kind of see those points in there where it creates a lot of problems. So it's a good technique for doing that kind of stuff. And it helps you group things together. Uh, interaction charts, this is kind of similar to uh, mechanical charts, but it really helps you understand what the purpose of something is. So in this example, you have a bunch of like bone units, like little minions that run around. Uh, and they're like, I give them a category. I like to use military terms because it's just easier for my, my categorization. And so I say, all right, this is a unit and it's of an infantry class. It could be of a fodder class or a weak or trash, whatever, it doesn't matter. The word is just a, an association there. And then uh, you'll have something like a fireball. And my goal of fireball is to be a counter to infantry units. And so I can make sure in my like, relationships and my charts and my things that the fireball, because if I want it to be a counter to infantry units, it needs to do enough damage to infantry. And if I have an infantry unit that's got a ton of health, fireball doesn't counter it, it's probably not an infantry unit. It's probably some other classification. And so you kind of create these relationships between your parts, and you're trying to kind of find what is the function, what are your... What is the goal of it? And those kind of different pieces can really help you balance it. You know, for this particular, this is a, a fire elemental, uh, and its job in life is to um, make you kind of have this synergistic combos with fire. The more fire skills you cast, the cheaper and more powerful this thing gets. And so its whole job in life is to create synergy with fire, right? And so that's, that kind of like interaction can really help you. But then its attributes are uh, bomb and is a category I use for something that like, the game's going to be over really quick unless you deal with it. It's kind of like a big, huge moment in the pacing. Uh, and so there's things that kind of counteract those, and you kind of start to build these kind of intricate charts between everything, and I call them interaction charts. Uh, they're super useful. You know, here's another one where this is an infantry unit, but its job in life is to counter spells. And so this particular unit is immune to all spells in the game, but it's really, it's like a, a low infantry unit. And so this thing counters fireball because fireball is a spell and it creates these kind of different interactions between them. And so really breaking all your pieces down once again helps you kind of find 
the ways you can make your parts really different from each other, uh, but it's a technique I use a lot. Uh, and you know, what it'll end up looking like it usually is kind of a balanced spreadsheet where it kind of creates a type on one side and an interaction on another side, which allows me to kind of do some sorting. I can go, all right, uh, in the game right now, infantry is the most powerful thing ever. Well, let me go look at my counters to infantry, and I'm like, oh, wow, all of these skills are bad. That's probably why this is such a problem. And so you can kind of do these interesting kind of relationship checks between stuff. If you find spells are overused, you can go buff your counters to spells. If you find, you know, uh, the game is all, is really, really slow, you might go look at things that are categorized as sandbag, which are stuff that slows the game down. And so these kind of charts can really help you uh, fix your pacing problems. All right. Um, economy balance. Uh, this is kind of a whole other category of balance. Uh, I usually define economy balance when you're really trying to think about like the inputs and outputs of a system. Uh, often these balance types will and intermix together depending on the types of stuff you're doing. Uh, but that's kind of like my litmus test for what economy balance is. Uh, so in economy balance, I really like to look to real life systems because uh, when people have lots of money and, and, and stuff's on the line, they tend to build things that solve your problems. And so uh, I, I really look at this uh, system, it's called Forex trading. Uh, it's basically the, if you ever go to an uh, airport and you see the little thing that's like uh, currencies in different countries are equal in different amounts, that's the whole concept of Forex trading. Uh, despite people not really knowing what it is, it's like 10 times as big as stock markets uh, and it's open 24 seven. Uh, and so it's this kind of like big fixation to me to how economies work. And uh, there's this really interesting concept in Forex trading and it's called support and resistance. And the idea is that as a market fluctuates, kind of goes up and down, uh, that there is stuff that stops it from going lower. This is kind of called a support. And then there's also forces that stop something from going higher, it's called a resistance. And you kind of create this band between your support and resistance and this is how I like to balance economies. Because I like to have wide margins of error uh, for all of my balance, I just found this is a margin that you're saying as long as something lives in between these bounds, then its economy is balanced. And, uh, you know, and, and then it becomes easier for me to go, all right, if I see the thing going down too much, I just need to add more support to the game. Or if I see the uh, economy inflating or going crazy in one way, I know I need to add more resistances to it. And so there's kind of some trade-offs, and I'll explain what supports and resistances look like. Uh, in a game. I think I just explained this whole thing. Um, all right, so what is a support? Uh, supports are usually sinks. They're usually reductions in uh, you know, a particular item. Say you have gold, because it's a very simple thing that most people are economy, or like dollar bills or something in your game that represents a currency. Uh, if you see that currency kind of getting more and more worthless, like you're piling it up and there's nothing to spend it on, it's because it doesn't have enough support. It doesn't have enough things to spend, like uh, to reduce that, that stock. Uh, other things that can look like supports uh, are things that you can kind of trade between other currencies. In uh, Guild Wars, you can trade gold for a hard currency. Uh, this ends up being a really good way that we can kind of filter money out of the economy. We take a cut on the back end and it becomes a sink uh, to the game. And so, uh, you know, filters are a good one. Uh, shops or vendors or things in the game, also a, a phenomenal way to kind of reduce things out of an economy. Once again, you're just sinking or destroying that particular resource. Uh, gambling is also another good one. Uh, you know, gambling systems, at the end of the day, their uh, economic output destroys wealth in a video game. In real life, that wealth goes somewhere, which is usually the casino, uh, and so, you know, they can be used in different ways, but uh, often I see games adding a, a casino with no other goal in life than to just balance some uh, economy issue because they're really good supports. If suddenly you have millions of some resource, like gold in a game, well, you'll go gamble with it because it's fun, uh, and you'll lose a whole lot of it because of math. Um, and so they're really good for uh, destroying stuff in the economy, converting things, or uh, you know, services that allow you to use it up. And these are different types of supports. There's a whole lots of different types of supports, but you want to think about in your game, what are those outputs for your economy? What are the supports that keep things from just becoming worthless? Uh, so resistances, resistances are often ways that things don't become too expensive. Uh, so farming ends up being like the most common one in any sort of video game, uh, at least the things I make, where people generate that resource with time. They spend time in the game, they kill a monster, they get the resource. Uh, there's all kinds of different types of farming, but this, this kind of concept of farming means that the player can trade their time for the item. So if suddenly that item starts becoming worth $100 billion an hour, they will just go farm it and its price will come down. 
And so uh, these become really common and easy to use. You tend to add resistances to the game without thinking about it uh, because they're usually just trying to put them in the game. Other ways that we do it in Guild Wars, you can take an item and break it down into materials. It's kind of a concept of salvaging or uh, refinement. You're taking one type of thing and converting it into another. This allows you to kind of pin two different economies together. If gold's starting to go up and it starts to become uh, you know, super expensive, or I mean super plentiful, then they can kind of filter it into something else. They can buy something or destroy other items and they create another item. And so like resistances and supports can have kind of an inverse relationship with each other with different items. Um, and Guild Wars 2, another uh, system that we had is a one called Mystic Forge. This is really where you like dump a bunch of garbage into something and then push a button and it randomly generates something. And sometimes it becomes like a really powerful item that everyone wants. And so it allows you to kind of convert something into another, which becomes another type of resistance. Uh, and so things that are often resistances are generating, converting, or changing something's value uh, as, as it goes. Uh, good uses of resistances are they really create that margin of balance. Like you're, you're kind of defining the upward and the topward bounds of something. Uh, and they're also really good for protecting against exploits. If suddenly someone generates, you know, uh, uh, tons and tons of wealth in the game, those systems can kind of like keep your, your economy from blowing up. All right, uh, indexes. Uh, this is another concept that I steal from economy design. Uh, and this is uh, taking, you know, like there's uh, consumer price index, which can be like, all right, here's these common items that all consumers use. We're going to look at their price over time and see how they're going up. And that's how we can measure inflation or the health of an economy. Uh, there are often these just kind of uh, compilations of a lot of different parts inside the economy. Um, I find them really, really useful because uh, economies are really complex and uh, I'm lazy, as I said before. And so I'm always looking for ways that I can just at a quick glance know if something's good or not. Uh, and so I build a lot of indexes into Guild Wars 2 because it's this giant, crazy economy. And so here's a bunch, here's a slice of one of those indexes. Uh, these are different types of items that exist in a game. They're these really commonly used trophy items that are passed around. And then I build this little index and so I can kind of see uh, overall trends of what's going on in the economy. You know, here's one of our big expansions that came out and a bunch of items kind of dropped down. And that made this whole big loop of like, oh God, what did we do? And we went and did a bunch of investigation and found out we added a ton more sources to them and we didn't entirely mean to. And so these indexes can be really useful for you to peer into your economy. And they're not a ton, they're not super hard to put up. Uh, you know, in this particular example, all we're doing is looking at the price over time. You know, we save off the price in our data uh, every you know, three or four minutes. And so we can just kind of put that into a big chart and see where it's going on. And so if you're ever doing some crazy economy balance, indexes are the way to go. Um, I use this technique in the game to kind of a crazy degree. And I made this item, it was called a, a, a glob of ectoplasm. And I made it, like the economy all intentionally funnel into this item. So all the items would kind of be destroyed and turn into this item. And then all of the rare drops in the game kind of generated this item. And you could look and see that item, and I could balance the health of the economy by just looking and seeing where that item was. And my goal was always trying to keep it between this 30 and 40 silver range, because that was this like, value that I determined the economy is healthy. And you can see towards you know, one year, things went kind of crazy, and it started coming down. I think it's actually still crazy, and it's way down here. Uh, and you know, that allows us to look at it and go, what, is our economy healthy or not, or is something going awry? Uh, and it just becomes a really quick thing you can check. So indexes are super good. Keep an eye on the economy or finding odd correlations where suddenly something shifted and you don't know why. Uh, it can be kind of this like warning moment of go figure out what happened. Um, now, when it comes to economies, I like to talk through the concept of kind of open uh, loops and, and closed loops. Uh, an economy where everyone's able to trade things and uh, interact, it's what an open loop is. And they're crazy. They're a lot of work to manage. Uh, you know, Guild Wars... I got a team of about 10, 12 people that all they're kind of paying attention to do is looking and seeing what that economy is, we're interacting with it, how it goes. You know, we have to run an entire customer service team who's protecting against, uh, you know, people who are screwing with the economy or exploiting it or doing types of stuff. Uh, closed loops are really, or open loops are really, really expensive because they're a lot of effort to maintain and police and do all these interactions. A controlled system is like uh, inside your game, if it's not multiplayer or it's single player, all the systems just live inside it. You might still have an economy design, like I've played plenty of Final Fantasy games where 
uh, I have way too much gold and it becomes this worthless resource. And so there's still some balance to things that you have to pay attention to. But a controlled system has a lot more kind of control over what those inputs or outputs. And you can still use some of the same techniques between both, but realize the craziness between the two. Uh, and anytime there's an open system, what I find is everybody seems to ignore the fact that black markets exist. And everyone might think that uh, black markets are something you can defeat, but I find that they're just every economy in the history of the world has never had not had a black market. So the question is, uh, was it Fable you were talking about? Yeah. Uh, in Fable, there was some uh, exploit where people could kind of buy, sell, and screw up the economy. Yeah. Um, you know, that's an example of, uh, of just someone not doing a proper support and resistance of their model. Uh, you know, uh, exploits happen all the dang time. Uh, and, and so those, those become really interesting interaction points for an economy because you can ruin a game really quickly with an exploit. Uh, and um, those are kind of a little bit different than I'd say with strength and resistance where you're trying to like manage the balance, the health of the economy. Exploits uh, are kind of the way that you deal with them is kind of the way that you deal with bugs when you're writing code or any sort of that interactions. You're trying to think about all possible scenarios. Uh, in Guild Wars, we thought of this like, well, what happens if someone made the price of an item higher than the, the sell of the item? We'd infinitely create, uh, you know, generating tons of money. So we just made the value of an item is uh, a ratio of its sell value. And so as long, and then we just never let that go below one, and then you can never have that exploit ever happen. Um, and so there's kind of interesting techniques you can use, but it usually is all about kind of error handling and dealing with stuff. And it's a little bit different than I'd say game balancing. Well, ex exploits are easy to continue, like all bugs are. Uh, you know, you tend to have a game that you worked on a year ago, and you put that thing down, and a year goes by, you totally forget about the weird bugs that you had to work around. Uh, and so, like, those types of things can perpetuate as stuff goes on. All right, uh, pacing. Pacing is another type of uh, balance that we tend to do a lot. This is a pretty famous chart of like the pacing of Star Wars and how it kind of builds up over time. But you tend to do this similar type of pacing uh, in any type of game, whether it's like you're leveling in through your game or you're trying to create some epic moments inside your game. And so pacing is kind of a deep type of balance that often we don't think about as balanced. Um, and kind of the goal that I always like to try to remind people about pacing is that your goal is to try to help so the player win. Uh, people often go kind of the opposite of this. We're like, well, I want my game to be really hard and interesting. And, and so you get into this kind of like thought processes of, of punishing versus difficult. And they're kind of these two um, different words that I like to use for it. And so a, a mechanic that's punishing is something that's kind of like pounding in the face. You're, you don't know what's going on. You don't know why you're winning. And it, it makes you frustrated and you leave a game. Uh, where a game that's difficult, it kind of guides you through the difficulty curve. They, they, they kind of like introduce Mario as a phenomenal example of it. Like they have this whole kind of like rhythm to the way they teach you things. They introduce some mechanic to you. They do it with safety. You can think about like if you ever played Mario, Mario 1, there's always like a jump in the very beginning where you can jump over and there, it's not a pit. It's just a, you fall down, you jump back up. They're kind of teaching you a safety. It's a really common technique. So they, here's a new mechanic. We're going to teach it to you. It's safety. And then they slowly remove that safety. Eventually the the pit becomes a hole that you can fall in. Uh, then eventually they slowly start to make it, then they turn it into a challenge. All right, you understand the mechanic, falling down pits is bad. All right, we're gonna start to make the jumps wider and wider and wider. And so it's this kind of rhythm that happens with games where you're trying to help kind of control the pacing and help, but the goal of it is to help them win. You're not trying to uh, defeat the player. That would be very easy to do as, as a designer. All right, uh, the other thing you're trying to create in here is this tension. You're trying to kind of create, when you're, when you're making pacing, you're, you're trying to create these moments of kind of resistance and, and moments of, of interesting interaction in, in your gameplay. And so it's all about how do you create tension, which is, uh, there's lots of kind of interesting techniques. Take an example from like sports. Sports often have a lot of tension around uh, a timer on the clock, right? Uh, a, a period or a gameplay comes to an end, and so there's all this tension of all of a sudden, at one moment in the game, even though you're doing the same thing, 
suddenly your actions matter on a level that's way, way bigger than they did before. And this is creating a tension that creates a lot of memorable moments in games. Uh, when you tell your stories to other people about games, it's often because of really good tension that was created in the pacing. Uh, and it's like, oh, do you remember that moment where we almost won? Blah, blah, blah. It goes like that. Um, and so uh, other, you know, uh, casinos have actually gotten really, really, really good at this particular moment because they found it makes them money. Uh, and so they've, like, found this kind of psychological uh, parts about the human brain loves this moment. Uh, and, like, there's nothing that makes someone pull the lever more than almost winning. And so there's a lot of uh, this kind of like feeling of almost that you do a lot of design around. You always kind of create this like, oh, we almost got there. Because uh, unlike a normal situation where it's like win or loss, um, on a win or loss, you have someone that's happy and someone that's sad. Uh, but if the person who lost almost lo won, then they actually walk away like, oh, if I, I could do it again, or I'll, I'll get a little bit better. And they kind of create these, these interesting moments, which is why gambling uses it. If you almost won a million dollars, you pull it again, right? And so you're always trying to create this feeling of almost in your games. And uh, you know, uh, a lot of getting this feeling across in pacing comes from an odd place. It's all for messaging. It's all for making it really clear. The fact that this almost was here and your brain knows that it goes here, the fact that it was told to you makes you go, oh, I almost won. And so a lot of almost comes from really clear messaging, really hammering on simplicity of your game, Getting uh, the player to understand what's going on can be really, really helpful. Um, another good thing that I end up doing in pacing, and you see this all the time, is just take whatever kind of experience you're laying out there, whether it's flying through a level on a spaceship, or whether it's going through a story, and make a chart of it. Line up all the moments, and you can just put them in a line, write them down, and then you can just make a, add a number to it. Go, all right, I want this moment to be this level of pacing. And then you can kind of graph it out, because Excel is the best tool ever. Uh, and you can see exactly where those, you know, uh, where your tension moments are. And sometimes you'll find that you wanted it to be that this moment inside this video game, when you're going up this awesome, creepy escalator, you wanted this to be some crazy tension moment. And then when people are playing it, or whether you're playing it, and you're like, ah, it's just not, this is kind of a boring moment you realize that your kind of goals for what you wanted out of that pacing are very different from what actually happened. And so these kind of charts are really useful. We make them all the time. Every bit of content we do, we write these out because they can be really good guiding lines to tell us those are the moments in the game that we need to put more focus on. You need to polish this moment a lot more than all your other moments. And so you're gonna put a lot more art into it. You're gonna put a lot more time into it. You're gonna make sure that moment feels amazing because if it doesn't, then, uh, then you're going to miss, miss short of that pacing beat. Uh, you can see this all over the place. Uh, you know, I'll take the frames. When I'm looking at the frames for an animation and I'm kind of working on a, just even a punch, there's a pacing to it, right? There's that same chart, that same kind of uh, beats that go everywhere else where you get the wind up, the build up, the moment, and then the execute. And, like, you know, and then you go back to idle really, really quickly. Uh, and like you're always trying to play with that same pacing. If I want to make an attack that feels sluggish, I'm going to have a little bit different pacing chart. I might have a big sword that slams and then a really long moment for it to come back. And that's just those, I can create those kind of moments of pacing, those interaction points, those kind of different pieces to go. So realize that same chart, that same layout can get you a lot in, a, in different ways. Um, you even see some of these pacing in odd places like... Uh, marketing techniques. Uh, this is kind of the funnel that you live and die by when it comes to marketing. You have this like awareness and then it turns into people deciding whether they want to buy something and then they convert, they buy your thing and then they either play it for a really long time, become loyal and if they play it forever they become an advocate. I am a Guild Wars player. Uh, those types of things. Uh, and this is just a pacing chart that goes along types of things and you can understand, you can look at those charts and know, okay, what do I need to do to create more of this? What do I need to create more of this? And this chart allows you to see that <coughs> a lot of effort needs to be put up here because it has an effect on everything down below. And so these kind of different charts for your pacing of mechanics can really help you know whether you need, where you need to balance something and where you need to interact with it. Um, biased are something you have to deal with in pacing a whole lot. It tends to be the case that uh, when you're making a game, you know a lot more about it, you know how things interact, you know what you're trying to do, and thus, it makes you horrible at evaluating pacing. Uh, and so uh, I often find that 
I have to step away, I have to get other people to watch and play it. This is why you want usability testing. This is why you want to get, you know, turn to your neighbor and say, please play my thing so I can watch you because they lack a lot of uh, the same biases that you have. But also recognize that we are all biased about something. We all have our own narrow point of view, a lens into the world of the game that we're looking at or whatever we're evaluating. And in order to get a really good experience, you want to collect, uh, you know, you want to collect a whole bunch of other biases, put them all together. That way you can kind of really get the reality of what's going on. And uh, this is a technique I often use in pacing. Uh, and so in this particular example, I used a bunch of people's names at the company and it won't make any sense to you. So I'll explain it through. Um, I'll make these type of charts, uh, and this is a, a skill matrix chart where I'm trying to say, in this particular example, it was a skill matrix of people who could spell. Uh, and so this is the, our uh, head of editing, and I was like, this is a grandmaster. This guy has a bias if he understands uh, you know, language to a really interesting degree. So if I'm making a game that's all about spelling, I really want to get his perspective, but I also got to realize this guy's like the hardcore spelling guru person. He's going to find all these idiosyncrasies and the different ways you spell color and, and stuff like that, uh, where not everyone's going to know. And then I can find someone of medium skill level, someone who's good at spelling, uh, and I want to make sure I run with them. And then I can find someone who's a total noob at spelling. Uh, and then I can find someone who's like worse than a fifth grader, which is me. Uh, I'm really bad at spelling. Uh, and so I'll make this chart. And then I go have each one of these people play test, and I observe them. And I watch how they play the game. I would watch how they figure out and interact with the spelling game. And then I can use that to try to complete a more complete picture of skill levels. I can get a better sense of like, oh, I see what this game, you know, where this game's going to be good at. Hey, it's pushing really well on these experts, but it's really bad at getting these people who aren't good at spelling. And I don't want them to chase them away. How do I, how do I make these things better? Or I'm like, this game's all about the hardcore spelling nerd, who cares about this stuff? That's fine, but I can at least get a little bit of a test. And these charts can be used in any way, shape, or form. If you're Mario, you know, I, can, I could have like my grandma play Mario, who's probably not super good at jumping, uh, but my little brother is gonna just destroy me, right? And like, I can make this chart and get everyone to play, and that gives me a really good sense of uh, different skill levels and helps me overcome that bias. My brain stops thinking about, oh, this one person's point of view, which is often me, and starts coming into, uh, you know, if I'm the one making a spelling game, I'm gonna think the game's horrible most of the time, but it's not for me, it's for a different audience, it's for different things. And so by making a chart and by making these things, it forces me into kind of evaluating the game in different ways. Uh, and, you, and I make these for all kinds of different reasons and you get kind of crazy with it. Uh, <coughs> that's kind of the end of my random rambling. Uh, these are a few links that aren't super useful here, but I'll leave the deck with someone here so you can go through them. Um, <clears throat> these are links from people that I really uh, like the way they've kind of explained some of these same topics that I talked about. One is Richard Garfield. He made magic, really good at some of these systems. He did some talk on a boat sometime long ago, uh, and I watched the whole talk before I had ever seen it, and it looked exactly like a couple presentations that I did, and so I was like, man, this is cool. It's another perspective of that same thing. Uh, then he also did another one on luck versus skill, which is a pretty interesting topic in that everyone kind of thinks that the two things are mutually exclusive to each other. And he goes into a really interesting uh, uh, talk about how they're not mutually exclusive and that they're kind of different axes on a point. Uh, and then extra credit does a hell of a lot better job than I ever will on explaining the difference between hard and punishing. And this is explaining how we're trying to like, guide the player through with all those pacing. So these are a couple of really good talks on the particular subject of balance. It's a really deep subject, and I kind of just barely touched on the, the surface of a lot of the things. But if you have questions, I will gladly answer them. You got one in the back. See how you're having for a while? Um, why are you uh, on leveling these uh, grinding games? It seems uh, so grinding is a really interesting topic. The question was, why do some games use grinding as a way to balance kind of their pacing through leveling? Uh, the answer is simple, is that uh, generally people like grinding. Uh, it's this weird misconception that everyone uses it as kind of a derogatory term towards stuff, but that's, it, it's not always true. Um, there's a really good study out there called the Quantum Foundry. It's a service that has taken a math approach to solving player motivations. Uh, and in the Quantum Foundry, they found no matter how they sliced data, no matter how they looked at like, you know, who the person was, what type of games they liked, where it was, they had progression in the top three things that they cared about. And so the reason why grinding and level of stuff existence is as human beings, we really like progression. We really like the sense of accomplishment. We really like the sense of growth. 
uh, mainly because it comes and hits into three main psychological uh, key points that human beings like. If you've, it's called uh, ST, I don't remember the acronym for it, but uh, whatever, it's uh, about mastery, autonomy, and relatedness. Those are like the three human motivations that everything can boil down to, and uh, uh, progression hits one of those key beats, which is mastery. So the reason why people put grinding in a game where you kind of level up is because it makes us feel good to be good at stuff. It makes us feel good to put time in and get better and see that progress. Uh, where it goes wrong is if you balance something wrong, you make people do it too long, or if you get your pacing wrong and that balance is screwed up, then people go, this game is sucky and grindy and they get mad about it. But it's a really good moment. Over here, then here. So I, I tried this a lot, and this talk is really funny because it starts off with the same place that I started, uh, even though I'd never seen it before. Uh, when I started doing some balance, I tried to write an algorithm that would balance uh, our powers in our game. It was like, look at cost, look at effects, and it would do all this balance. And what ended up happening is I would write the algorithm, and I would go test it in the game, and I'd be like, that's not right, and I'd write the algorithm. And eventually I had like 100 powers in the game and 100 exceptions inside my formula. Uh, and so what I find is that the formula is not actually a really good place to start. Um, a formula can help like prove a theory. Like I like to use formulas and things as like tests, like science of like, is my economy, how do I know if my economy is inflating? Or how do I know if the economy is going wrong? I could write an algorithm to tell me that, um, but I find it's really hard to just like write an algorithm to tell me how to balance it. You might be able to write an algorithm to say, um, when the economy starts getting to this level, make the sinks in the game all change, right? And so like you could do some of that kind of stuff. Uh, but it's a really hard place to start, actually. Uh, and so I tend to end up doing a lot more of the kind of uh, analysis on that level later in the system when more things are defined, because then I start to make less exceptions. Um, little stuff right here. How is it so long? So um, uh, EVE Online, the, the, the question there was uh, uh, one of the longest running economies in the game is EVE Online. How the heck do they do it? Uh, the answer is a lot of the techniques I was talking about here, they use really, really well. Uh, they hired an economist a long time ago. They're one of the first big companies to like actual hire a full-time economist and have them work on their staff. Um, the biggest thing they use is a strength and resistance model. Uh, they use a really funny technique where they basically said, what if we allow players to take the in-game currency of the game and pay for their subscription fee? Uh, and before that, their economy was kind of a wreck. And then after that, their economy suddenly became perfect, um, or at least what it is today. Uh, and then all they really did was create the world's best support model ever uh, because they allowed people to change in-game time for real-life money. Uh, it turns out people really like that exchange. Uh, and so... Um, you know, that's one of the reasons why they were able to do it. But the short of it was they hired an economist who sits there and stares at those numbers every day, applies tests and theories, goes, what happens to this do to the economy? What does this do to the economy? And then they change stuff constantly over time. Uh, and they use a lot of player-driven economies. They understand there's a black market. They understand that uh, the interactions in their economy from their players are going to change stuff and, uh, and just keep a really close eye on it. You can actually go look at their index. Like I was talking about indexes. They have, uh, I think their currency is called ISK or something. Uh, I think they have an ISK index that you can look at and see at all times, and you can see where life lives. Uh, they also format all of their trading systems the same way that Forex trading does. You can go look at that bar graph that I threw, threw up there. You can see that on any one of their economies. And so they're using the same kind of approaches I'm talking about. They use real-world examples and real-world me methodologies to balance their economy. And they've been successful at it. Not always. They've definitely had huge periods where they've screwed up their, their balance, uh, like everyone does. Uh, but they've been going for a long enough time, and they have some people that kind of know what they're doing, and they've done a really good job. I, I love their economy really well. Right here, and then back there. there. You, you. Okay. Uh, when you go about balancing really competitive games, like StarCraft, for example, where uh, it goes to like that spelling game, you know, where it's like some people. How do you go about balancing both the units and also applying skill level into it? So like I know that they do balance based off of like the pro scene a lot because it's kind of just like a whole mess in the lower ranks. Basically. Yep, yep. Yeah. So uh, the question was, how do you take the kind of array of skills of balance and apply that uh, to when you're balancing the game for like 
a really, really hardcore StarCraft player or um, you know, someone who's kind of new at the game? The answer is you end up having, it's a factor of time, all right? You sort of decide where you're gonna spend your time. Uh, most of the time people decide to spend a lot of their time at the top of the level, right? Oh, we're gonna look at the competitive scene. Uh, and this is why when a game's going, applying algorithms and data to it can help you get out of that, that, uh, that kick. Um, like League of Legends is a super good example because I know their team really well. Um, everyone kind of thinks of League of Legends and they think of all the people that are playing the game, like this is a PvP game. Uh, and it's kind of the world's biggest lie because 60% of their audience plays bots 24 seven, that's all they play. Uh, and so like, if you were to just focus on the end balance and that was the only thing you ever cared about, you would have 60% of your audience that you're never balancing for. And so they have to use data in order to get a better view, to get a wider view of how many different people play. And so that's the technique. Um, it's harder to do data when you don't have data. So like before you're shipping a game, then you're kind of always playing around with different balloons, which is why you build one of those charts, right? The way they did it on StarCraft, StarCraft 2 specifically, is they brought in a bit of pro StarCraft 1 players into like their, their test branches and they got them to play and they would watch what they were doing and then they would turn in their offices and they get people around the office to play, which tend to be on the noob level, uh, and they would get them to play and they would try to balance those experiences. As a game ships, when it becomes out there on launch, people tend to focus a lot more on the hardcore scene. And you know the reason is is because of that perception of balance. If the hardcore scene is perceived as balanced, then even if it's not balanced everywhere else, everyone's like, oh, it's a balanced game. Oh, I'm losing right now because I don't understand how to play at the same level as other people. Uh, and so that's why people tend to focus on the top, is it helps with that perception, it helps with that understanding this game is balanced. And so the answer is you split your time, you, you tend to focus on the two extremes, the hardest core and like the people who are just coming into the game because of that funnel problem. Uh, and sometimes people in the middle get lost. Um, the way we have to do it is my balance team comes back to me and I'm like, all right, where's the numbers? Uh, break, out, break out some SQL and get me a lot of data. Uh, because you can just take something and like, take that chart where it's like A, B, C, D. I could just pull uh, skills equipped inside our game and you can kind of build that chart from there. I can see like, here's a bunch of skills and that doesn't care about your skill level. That's just everybody in the game. And so using data is the kind of uh, best way around it. All right, we had one over here. I have no idea how we're doing on time, so. Okay, I'm gonna be late, so I'll take one more and then we'll run away. I think that's a huge feeling of it. Uh, that feeling of almost, right? Uh, I think there's a lot of like nuances to why the battle royale games are like exploding. Um, some of which are like they're easier to stream than a lot of other games. But the feeling of almost is insane in there, right? Like, because there's all these random elements and everyone like, I hate random, but that game is like a giant random engine, uh, like every version of them. Uh, but it creates that feeling of almost. I almost got the gun before the guy punched me in the head. You know, I almost won. I, I was number two. And that's why like the game has got this infectious storytelling, right? And like anytime you have someone coming up to you and going, oh, I remember I did all this cool thing. And you don't even know that that feeling of almost was usually the cause of it. And so... I totally think they've like maximized for that in that game and like at every level of every interesting interaction, they've like, oh, how do we make a feeling of almost better? And that's why the game has done so well, despite the fact it's buggy as hell and as a developer, it makes me cry inside. Um, when you slave over all your work and then you see this buggy thing and you're like, they're destroying me. Uh, it, it's soul crushing sometimes, but they've done a phenomenal job of maximizing almost. So, all right.